Kim teaches at UC Irvine, where she was, is professor of political science and Asian American studies. She teaches classes on comparative race studies and human animal studies. Her first book, Bitter Fruit, The Politics of Black Korean Conflict in New York City, won two awards from the American Political Science Association, the Ralph Bunch Award for the best book on ethnic and cultural pluralism, and the best book award from the organized section on race and ethnicity. Her second book, Dangerous Crossings, Race, Species, and Nature in a Multicultural Age, which came out in 2015, is also a recipient of a Best Book Award from the APSA's Organized Section on Race and Ethnicity. Dr. Kim was co-guest editor of a special issue of American Quarterly, Species, Race, Sex, which appeared in September 2013, and co-organizer of the Race and Animals Institute at Wesleyan University in June of 2016. She's the recipient of a grant from the University of California Center for New Racial Studies, and she has been a fellow at the University of California's Humanities Research Institute and a visiting fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. She's currently working on a book entitled Asian, Amer Asian Americans in an Anti-Black World, and uh, we are just delighted to have her here. Please join me in welcoming her to speak on murder and mattering in Harambe's house. Thank you. Providing a vegan reception after, um, and thank you all for being here. The title of my talk is Murder and Mattering in Harambe's House. I will be speaking today about how the notion of the black and the notion of the animal are foundational to the meaning of the human and thus the modern world. I want to begin by acknowledging some of the dangers of talking about the subject in an academic setting such as this. I have in mind two in particular that are reproducing the association between these two topics in an effort to expose and analyze how the association gets posited and the work it does. And that of appearing to deflect or dilute the claims of the black freedom struggle by bringing animals into the picture. These dangers are too important to ignore, but so too are the ethical concerns that press me to discuss these matters in the first place. So I'll try to make the case here today for why we need to confront the Black Animal Association head-on in an effort to disrupt it, and how we can and must do so in a way that keeps the Black freedom struggle at the center of our concerns, and how we might do all of this in a way that expands the commitment to Black liberation, this ethical project, to include the liberation of animals. Before they were killed by apes, 
but he has taught himself to read and write by poring over the primers he discovered within. His childlike use of all capital letters meant to convey emphasis and indexes his awkward, incipient language relation to human language. Throughout the novel, Tarzan's halting journey to acquire language, his inability to read script, his unfamiliarity with speaking, his initial acquisition of French rather than English, tracks his gradual ascent into true, that is, English civilization. He writes his first words here to announce a proprietary claim, and he grounds the claim on his skill at dealing out death. Language, property right, and death craft are organic elements of the transformation from ape to human. Killer of Beasts and Many Black Men. Burroughs novel was published in 1914 during the heyday of lynching in the United States. And one year before D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation, thrilled white audiences by depicting the healing of the national body, the achievement of North-South reconciliation through the destruction of the black body, or what Philip Dre calls lynchcraft. Tarzan's preferred method of killing is significantly the noose the use of which affects by moving up the evolutionary scale, targeting first a gorilla, then an anthropoid ape, then African villagers. But Tarzan's phrase indicates, despite the nod to black men as individuals to be enumerated, as opposed to generic beasts, is where he makes what Jacques Derrida calls the cut between those we may, quote unquote, non-criminally put to death, and those against whom this would constitute murder. Tarzan makes the cut on the basis of species and race. The killing of African villagers like that of beast is not murder, but to the contrary, a prerequisite for white home ownership. Burroughs writes, quote, Tarzan of the apes was no sentimentalist. He knew nothing of the brotherhood of man, unquote. Reading Tarzan's declaration today produces a certain unease and anxiety, perhaps, about what, if anything, differentiates our age from his. A half century after the US civil rights movement, a century after the novel was published, and nearly four centuries after slavery in the U.S. was first codified in the Virginia colony, the question of whether black people can be said to be murdered has not yet been settled. The Black Lives Matter movement, which emerged in 2013 after self-appointed neighborhood watchman George Zimmerman was acquitted for killing 17-year-old Trayvon Martin for walking while black in a residential area in Sanford, Florida, aims precisely to highlight the non-criminal putting to death of black people and to name these events as murder on the part of the police and their remarkably expansive posse comitatus. This term is, of course, a reference to the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, which empowered white sheriffs to impress any white person anywhere into a posse to hunt down fugitive slaves. As Alicia Garza notes, the prolif proliferation of responses to the Black Lives Matter project, Latino Lives Matter, Muslim Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, all lives matter, and so on, suggests a resistance to holding open a space to focus on the specific devaluation of black lives. All of which is to say the anti-black age that gave rise to Burroughs' novel is also ours. We live in what Sayyid Artman calls the afterlife of slavery, or in Christina Sharp's words, we live in the wake of the slave ship. The notion of a non-criminal putting to death is raised by Derrida in relation to the animal. It is the denial of murder in abattoirs, laboratories, farms, zoos, fisheries, and such that has made possible what he calls, quote, the industrial, mechanical, chemical, hormonal, and genetic violence to which man has been submitting animal life for the past two centuries, unquote. While thinking about the nearness of black men and beasts in Tarzan's mind, we might also think about the rendering of beasts as a cipher or zero figure of mattering. As well as the con connection between these two moves, why are beasts and black men the special targets of Tarzan's death path? Why does killing them provide reliable ground upon which to stake one's public identity and property right? What relations are being drawn among Tarzan and these other two figures? Burroughs approaches this last question with a mischievous glee, rolling out the pseudo-evolutionary trope and retracting it in the same breath. African villages are Tarzan's own kind, human, but not of his tribe, ape, or race, white. He steals their finery to conceal his nakedness and appear more human, but observes that they are more savage and cruel than the apes who raised him. It is not clear whether Tarzan has more in common with the apes or with the African villagers, and this indeed seems to be the point. To 
achieve English manhood, it is clear he must kill both beasts and many black men. But beyond that, nothing is certain. On May 28, 2016, a three-year-old child who was black was visiting the zoo, in, the zoo in Cincinnati, Ohio with his family. He told his mother he wanted to go see the gorillas close up. She said no. When she was not looking, he climbed over the bushes surrounding the gorilla cage and fell in, fell 10 feet into the shallow water therein. Harambe, a male western lowland gorilla, approached him and interacted with him for 10 minutes before zookeepers called in the Dangerous Animal Response Team, DART, to shoot Harambe dead. Standard protocol when a zoo animal is deemed a serious threat to a human. This is a picture of Harambe and the child moments before Harambe was shot. Um, and what we're missing by just looking at the still photo is the audio. Um, at this moment, the crowds had noticed the boy had fallen in and were screaming. A passionate argument erupted in the public sphere after Harambe was killed, particularly on social media, as to whether the killing was justified or necessary, with all manner of folks, including zookeepers, primatologists, parenting experts, and Hollywood celebrities, weighing in with great feeling. Harambe had meant the boy no harm, many argued. The video showed him, showed him holding hands with the boy and standing over him protectively, at one point situating himself between the screaming crowd and the boy. Some point into the August 1996 incident at the Brookfield Zoo, where the female gorilla, Minty Chua, picked up an unconscious three-year-old boy who had fallen into the cage and cradled him in her arms before handing him to the zookeeper. Or the August 1986 incident at the Jersey Zoo, where the male gorilla, Jumbo, stood guard over an unconscious five-year-old boy who had fallen in, stroking his back until zookeepers arrived. The scene in Harambe's cage was, in one sense, a primal scene of the human and the animal. The animal has been, since before the age of Aristotle, the zero figure against which human mattering has been measured, in, which, in what Giorgio Agamben calls the anthropological machine of humanism. The very word animal, Derrida notes, is an incoherent attempt to reduce, quote, an irreducible living multiplicity of mortals, unquote to a unitary category, an ill-disguised ploy to, quote, institute what is proper to man in relation to itself of a humanity that is, above all, careful to guard and jealous of what is proper to it, unquote. <coughs> Despite zookeepers who procure captives from hunters, who summon the sharpshooters of dart to dispatch any who step out of line, and dare daily forfeit the dearest needs of the animal for the momentary pleasure of the human are above all keepers of humanity, that is, protectors of what is proper to it. Lori Gruen writes that zoos are, quote, places that cause animal death, unquote. They are as well, and for this very reason, places that sustain human life. Fane Maynard, director of the Cincinnati Zoo, conceded that the Rambe had shown no signs of aggression toward the child, but insisted that he was agitated and disoriented. When critics argued Harambe had been trying to protect the boy from the crowd, Maynard parried, quote, that they didn't understand primate biology, unquote. He then declared, quote, we're talking about an animal that with one hand can take a coconut and crush it, unquote. Note, note the sleight of hand when confronted with evidence suggesting that Harambe's state of mind was not aggressive and perhaps even altruistic. Maynard answers by pointing to what Lisa Uden in another context calls the gorillas overwhelming presence of body, unquote, or extracorporeality. Animal equals all body, no mind. Following Maynard, we shift from asking about Harambe's mentation or intentions to focusing on Harambe's indisputable physical capacity to harm. How do we get from capable of harming to poses a mortal danger? The threat of capacity looms large to the degree that consciousness, will, agency, choice have been presumptively ruled out. Harambe, the fearsome 400-pound behemoth, impelled by raw instinct, was showing signs of disturbance. What other option was there? Though Maynard did not say that Harambe was vicious or bloodthirsty, we are clearly in the presence of Paul Dushayu's ghost. Dushayu was <coughs> the 19th century explorer, zoologist, anthropologist, whose explorations and adventures in equatorial Africa, 
Taiwan, launched the myth of guerrilla ferocity that found fateful expression decades later in Burroughs' Tarzan of the Apes and the film King Kong, dated 1933. After the gorilla was identified as a distinct species in 1847, Dushayu set out to be the first white man uh, to hunt and study the gorilla in the wild. His travels in Gabon in the 1850s produced dead gorilla bodies for scientific consumption and fantastical tales about gorilla behavior for popular consumption. This is an image reproduced from Dushayu's book about his first encounter with a gorilla. Note the great white hunter and the anonymous African assistant. More on that momentarily. And this is his famous description of the encounter. Nearly six feet high, with a man's body, huge chest, and great muscular arms, with fiercely glaring, large, deep gray eyes, and a hellish expression of face, which seemed to me like some nightmare vision, thus stood before us as king of the African forest. His eyes began to flash fierce with fire as he stood motionless on the defensive, and the crest of short hair which stands on his forehead began to twitch rapidly up and down while his powerful teeth, fangs, were shown as he again sent forth a thunderous roar. Now truly he reminded me of nothing but some hellish dream creature, a being of that hideous order, half man, half beast, which we find pictured by old artists in some representations of the infernal regions. He advanced a few steps, then stopped to utter that hideous roar again, advanced again, and finally stopped when at a distance of about six yards from us. And here as he began another of the roars and beating his breast in rage, we fired and killed him. Spectacularly, unforgettably, the gorilla bursts into the Western imaginary as a ferocious and murderous beast. That the King Kong slander has since been proven a slander, that all scientific data collected since then suggests that the gorilla suffers this reputation unjustly, has done little to weaken its hold on our imagination. A century and a half of primatological research has been no match for Dushayu's mythopoetic powers. Somewhat surprisingly, the prominent American taxidermist, conservationist hunter, Carl Aikley, was one of those bent on debunking Dushayu's myth. He is shown here in the camp, in camp with the corpse of a leopard that he described as having, quote, killed with his bare hands, quote. As he set out on an expedition to the Lake Kivu area on the border between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda in the 1920s to collect gorilla specimens for the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, Aikley already had in mind that gorillas had been badly maligned and that they were in fact, quote, extremely affectionate and perfectly amiable and decent, unquote, creatures who fought only to defend themselves or their families. Again and again, this sense was reconfirmed on his expeditions. Aikley wrote, quote, my experiences proved the correctness of my theory even more thoroughly than I expected, unquote. When he encountered the male gorilla who had become the giant of Karasimbi, centerpiece of his gorilla group in the museum's African <coughs> Aikley noted that he, like all of the other gorillas they met, tried to retreat into the foliage and not show himself. Aikley's companion felled him with a shot to the neck. And Aikley stood over his body, reflecting, like all of the others, he displayed no signs of aggressiveness. He had not made a single sound at any time. As he lay at the base of the tree, he took all one scientific ardor to keep from feeling like Aikley feels like a murderer again when he kills a female gorilla on a different occasion. Quote, the day I shot this female, I felt almost as if I had killed some decrepit old woman. Unquote. What haunts Aikley as he tracks, shoots, skins, skeletonizes, stuffs, and mounts these gorillas is the possibility that what he's engaged in, his passionate vocation, is not a non-criminal putting to death at all. Aikley's impassioned challenge to Dushayu reads as an effort to negotiate this contradiction. In a chapter entitled, Is the Gorilla Almost a Man? In his book, In Brightest Africa, 1923, Aikley proposes to explain, quote, why the gorilla has his aggressive reputation, unquote. He takes the famous quote from Dushayu, the one I just showed you, and edits it by, quote, putting, bracket, putting in brackets what Dushayu felt, leaving outside the brackets what the gorilla did. Okay, so putting in brackets what Dushayu felt, leaving outside the brackets what the gorilla did. The result is the following. So I have put the um, words that Aikley bracketed into a lighter color print. 
so we could just read the dark program, what the gorilla did. Nearly six feet high with a man's body, huge chest, and great muscular arms, with large, deep gray eyes. Thus stood before us as king of an African forest. He stood motionless on the defensive in the crest of short hair which stands on his forehead began to twitch rapidly up and down, while his powerful teeth and was shown as he again sent forth a thunderous roar. He advanced a few steps, then stopped to utter that roar again, advanced again, and finally stopped, when at a distance of about six yards from us, and here as he began another of his roars and beating his breath, he fired and killed him. Akeley, it turns out, has a point. Once we bracket out Dushaya's editorializing projections and confine ourselves to empirical description, the gorilla goes, in Akeley's words, from looking like a quote-unquote terrible animal unquote, to a creature doing, quote, nothing that a domestic dog might not have done under the same circumstances, unquote. Dushaya was compelled by his publishers to revise, that is, embellish, his manuscript at least twice, Akeley reminds us, in order to make it more exciting to his readers. This was the kind of mundane, venal consideration that went into creating the enduring King Kong slander. Having collected enough gorilla specimens for the museum, Akeley helped to persuade King Albert of Belgium to create a national park to protect the mountain gorilla habitat on the Virunga's volcanic mountain range. Akeley died during a return trip there where he had hoped to conduct a field study of the mountain gorillas. Four decades later, in 1967, Diane Fossey set up her first research station not far from where Aitlin was buried in the Kabara Meadow. Fossey was recruited by paleoanthropologist Louis Leakey to be one of the trimates, three young white women with limited formal training and field experience, whom he handpicked to do extended field studies of the great apes. As the gorilla girl, Fossey set up camp, I'm oh, sorry, Fossey set up camp in the Barungas and initiated field research that stretched over the better part of two decades. After several years, the gorillas she studied accepted and even embraced her presence. They solicited play with her, groomed her, hugged her, climbed on her, brought her wild celery stalks and napped beside her on the floors and floor, which is to say they developed relationships with her. One young male, Digit, formed an especially close bond with her over many years. And Fosse was never the same mentally or emotionally after she discovered his decapitated body in the forest. Poachers had speared him and then cut off his head and hands for sale. Fosse's book, Gorillas in the Mist, 1983, gives us a glimpse into the biological, social, and mental emotional life of mountain gorillas, whom she called the most maligned creatures on earth. We learn that mountain gorillas live in tight knit, family based groups typically one dominant silverback, an immature male or blackback, several females and juveniles and infants, and that they are curious, intelligent creatures who typically retreat upon encountering humans but will fight to the death to defend their kin. We see that the social and emotional relationships within each family group are textured, complex, and fluid, with relationships waxing and waning and individuals gaining and losing status over time depending upon, in part, contingent events. We observe as silverbacks protect their families against raids from other groups, usually having to do with contesting territory or obtaining females. We realize their survival as a species is profoundly in question, as poachers and cattle raisers and people raising cash crops for the market drive them back into an ever smaller piece of the forest. Akeley wonders aloud about the humanness of gorillas as he kills and dismembers them. But Fosse presents gorillas on their own terms like us and unlike us, rich in their own worlds. In that other key site of Western primatology, the laboratory, Francine Patterson has worked with Coco, a Western lowland gorilla, like Harambe, since the 1970s. Coco understands thousands of spoken English words and has learned a modified version of American Sign Language, which Patterson calls gorilla sign language. Coco uses this to communicate freely, indeed exuberantly, with the humans around her. As Donna Haraway writes in Primate Visions, quote, Coco invents jokes and insults, prompts answers and tests for her younger companion gorilla, reports on past events in her life, and displays her vulgar sense of humor. Quote. She photographs herself in the mirror, holds a cup up to her chimpanzee doll's lips during tea parties, 
and correctly identifies herself as a fine animal gorilla when asked if she's human or animal. At one point, Coco asked to have a pet kitten, whom she named All Ball. She nurtured and played with All Ball until he escaped from the laboratory one day and was killed by a car, an event that Coco remembered and mourned several years later, even several years later. She is, to use Lisa Uden's words, quote, a being who uses sign language to articulate her inner and individuated desires, her tastes, her passions, that is to say, her personhood, unquote. To riff on Linnaeus, Shirley Descartes never saw an ape like Coco. But whereas Fosse immersed herself in the world of gorillas and tried to speak their language, Patterson instructs Coco on human language in the laboratory where she is held captive. The house of science is a coercive one even when there are kittens. Coco's ability to please, that is her value, hinges on how closely she can mimic us. Despite the name, gorilla sign language is the language of the captor. When we delight in Coco's stories, we are delighting in the simulacrum of the human in non-human form. Language is the medium less for seeing into the mind of the other than for seeing ourselves reflected there. It is human access to human language that pushes Coco across the threshold of mattering. Coco was born in the San Francisco Zoo and lent to Patterson for her research, and in 1976, the zoo asked her back for breeding purposes. But Coco was no longer zooable. The thought of a communicative subject, a bearer of language and will and mind, being turned back into a zoo animal was unbearable. And the mayor of San Francisco intervened to save Coco from this. What did the loss of zooability on the part of an in-language Coco say about those of her species who remained in zoos? That they belonged there because they were human language lacking. Yet in fact, they had the same language potentiality as Coco. She was representative of her kind. She had been born a zoo animal. If Patterson had a larger laboratory, she could turn other gorillas, zoo gorillas, into cocos. Which is to say, human language as a get out of free, jail free card, or a get out of the zoo and into the laboratory card, happens not to have been gifted to other gorillas. And the precarious basis for their zoo ability, therefore, is not what or who they are, but rather what has been withheld from them. The human language lacking gorilla's mind, such that it is, remains a black box. The chasm seems unbridgeable, understanding impossible. Merriam-Webster offers two definitions of cipher. First, zero, one that has no weight, worth, or influence, a non-entity. Second, a method of transforming text in order to conceal its meaning, a message in code. The animal cipher is a non-entity and a secret code at once a blank slate and a hidden message, the footstool of human mattering and the outer limit of human logos. These definitions may not seem as contradictory, be as contradictory as they seem, since an indecipherable mind scarcely counts as a mind at all, when it really counts. Jane Goodall, the primate whose work with chimpanzees in Tanzania has made her the most famous primatologist in the world, supported the zoo's decision to kill Harambe. Quote, it would be difficult for even people familiar with Harambe himself, researchers or keepers who may have spent hours with Harambe, to ascertain his intentions from a distance in as short a time as it would take to do irreparable harm. Goodall, a pioneer in illuminating the phenomenological world of apes, acknowledges that Harambe has intentions, but then transfers our attention, a la Maynard, to Harambe's capacity to harm irreparably. In the case of the gorilla, as we have seen, this moon ends the conversation. Perhaps we withhold human language because we depend upon the inaccessibility of the animal mind. It is not that we cannot decipher the secret code of the animal, but rather that we have good reason not to try. Killing Harambe eliminated uncertainty about his harming the boy. Did it eliminate another uncertainty as well? cage great apes after a certain age because even after they have been gifted with human language, they are not reliably submissive. Even Coco lives in a cage. Gorillas are not domesticatable. They always remain a little bit wild. And that wildness, even though we try to make it about the body, resides in their minds. It is a quality of independence and a resistance to human sovereignty. At the Cincinnati Zoo, zookeepers noted 
that unlike his female companions, Chewie and Mara, Harambe did not heed the call to come inside. This was not a failure of language or communication, but a failure of obedience. He knew what they were asking him to do, and he chose not to comply. We are accustomed, following Descartes, to talk about animal reactions, but Harambe's actions declare themselves a response. Disregarding the zookeeper's call, he approached the child, stood over him, held his hand, pulled him through the water. He reversed the gaze that the zoo represents, and in so doing, turned the world upside down. Derrida describes how the gaze of his cat, as he's stepping out of the shower, leaves him naked and exposed. Quote, everything can happen to me. I am like a child, ready for the apocalypse. Unquote. Only after that moment passes, he explains, can he once again visit animals at the zoo. It is not just the fact of the animal's alterity, its otherness, the animal's possession of the gaze that terrifies us, but what is revealed to us upon recognizing that subjectivity, all of the grief and loss of being animal in a human world, the incomprehensible, interminable record of irreparable harms. It is worth doing almost anything to suppress this terror. Before Harambe's body was cold, zookeepers rushed in, made an incision in his scrotum, and extracted sperm to place in a frozen zoo for safekeeping. Thane Maynard was then able to say to the press, quote, there's a future. It's not the end of his gene pool, unquote. Note the absence of a subject in Maynard's first sentence. He could not possibly say, there's a future for Harambe. Who is it or what is it then that has a future, according to him? Harambe's gene pool. This slippage between species representative and individual animal, or more precisely, the substitution of the former for the latter, is how we have come to talk about wild animals in the age of conservation, or at least those whose numbers have dwindled enough to earn the designation in danger. Harambe, who was born in the Gladys Porter Zoo in Texas, was shipped to the Cincinnati Zoo under the auspices of the Gorilla Species Survival Plan, a breeding program for captive gorillas. The administrators of this plan assembled the family of Harambe, Chewie, and Mara for the purposes of reproduction, and the posthumous sperm procedure kept the dream alive. Gorilla scarcity produces gorilla value in the age of neoliberal capitalism. Every time a media story mentioned the gorilla's endangered status, Harambe word rose, as in, quote, the story of Harambe's death is particularly sad because Harambe was a Western lowland gorilla, 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 a subspecies of Western gorilla that is critically endangered. The language of conservation has a magical quality. There is no death here let alone murder. Indeed, death is transmuted into everlasting life. The language of conservation produces a heartwarming story out of a horror story. To follow the chain of human violence that structured Harambe's life, we would have to go at least as far back as the capture of his grandparents in Africa. Because gorillas fight to the death to defend the young in their group, capturing a baby gorilla often requires killing all of the adults in a group. Every baby gorilla capture leaves a bloody stain in the forest. Then there is the captive breeding program, which subjected his grandparents, his parents, and Harambe himself to the creation, breaking up, and shuffling of gorilla families, quote unquote, over the years, with an eye to maximizing conservation goals and zoo profitability. Gorillas are fungible, commodified bio units. Shooting Harambe and retrieving his sperm were acts that culminated a life lived in conceived in and lived in violence. By the special grace of conservation discourse, though, we get to see ourselves not as murderers and captors, or um, not as murderers and captors and chess masters, but as saviors and um, do-gooders. Narcissism appears as altruism and greed as self-sacrifice. We imagine we are touching the other, when in fact the other has never been more to us than a resource for the self which is to say we succeed as ever in evading Derrida's apocalypse. Harambe's sperm is safe. If we wish, we can make another gorilla and hope that he does not meet the same fate. If he does, we can harvest his sperm, and so on. In Playing in the Dark, Whiteness in the Literary Imagination, Toni Morrison draws our attention to what she calls the, quote, dark, abiding, signing Africanist presence, unquote, in the US literary tradition. 
even literary works that appear to have nothing to say about race, Morrison demonstrates, are organized upon closer inspection around an unspoken black presence. There is an obvious analogy in the political legal realm. The word slaves is not used in the US Constitution, and references to slavery therein are few. But slavery nevertheless shaped the institutional structure of the fledgling nation state, powered its economic growth, and defined its cultural imagination. Morrison writes, in what public discourse does a reference to black people not exist? The story of Harambe, too, is a story about blackness and anti-blackness. Perhaps it is inevitable, given the presence of a black child, that the scene in Harambe's case would be read as a crime scene or a scene of black transgression and violence. It was the boy's fault, well, because of his tender age, maybe his parents' fault, yes, his parents' fault, that Harambe was dead. This was an encroachment of the urban jungle into the Edenic jungle. If Harambe was shootable because he was animal, he was grievable, to use Judith Butler's term, because there was someone even blacker on the scene. He was another casualty of the epidemic of black violence that threatens to engulf us all. Thus, the Daily Mail ran a story entitled, quote, Father of Boy Who Fell Into Gorilla's Zoo Enclosure Has a Lengthy Criminal History, unquote which Fox News host Ainsley Earhart then seized upon in her coverage of Harambe's killing. It didn't matter that the boy's father had not been at the zoo that day. Perversely, the absent black father trope only strengthened the interpretation of the child as a criminal transgressor. Consider this petition circulated on change.org after Harambe was killed. More than a half million people signed this petition. It is upsetting that people vilify the Cincinnati Zoo an institution that has done so much work in trying to turn the tide against extinction in several critically endangered species. This beautiful gorilla lost his life because the boy's parents did not keep a closer watch on the child. It is believed that the situation was caused by parental negligence and the zoo is not responsible for the child's injury and possible trauma. We believe that this parental negligence may be reflective of the child's home situation. We, the undersigned, actively encourage an investigation of the child's home environment in the interest of protecting the child and his siblings from further incidents of parental negligence that may result in serious bodily harm or even death. Please sign this petition to encourage the Cincinnati Zoo, Hamilton County Child Protection Services, and Cincinnati Police Department to hold parents responsible. Okay, half a million signatures. In his new book, Black Masculinity and the Cinema of Policing, Jared Sexton writes about the trope of the racial state intervening to curb black parental violence and the trope of white people adopting abandoned black children. Think um, different strokes and Webster and shows like that. He argues that the black child is paradigmatically an orphan and yet not even an orphan, since being an orphan presumes pre-existing family ties and a black relationality that has been denied since the time of slavery to the present. Every story, even that of the shooting of a gorilla in the zoo, is transmuted into a black crime story. After nearly two centuries of writing crime into race, to use Khalil Muhammad's phrase, we have come to believe not only that all blacks are violent, but that violence itself is black. That violence is not a state monopoly a la Max Weber, but a black monopoly. In this schema, black presence is by definition a lethal threat to the non-black self. Black presence is fundamentally aggressive and menacing, so much so that when private citizens and state officials execute black women, men, and children for mundane actions such as driving away from a party, sitting in a car with friends, playing with a toy gun in the park, knocking on a person's door for help when your car breaks down, and walking on the street, this is taken to be reasonable rather than excessive force. When black ex existence is itself essentially violent, cast as essentially violent, anti-black violence becomes righteous, ethical, and necessary. <coughs> it's worth remembering that for the better part of a century in the US South, whites defended the lynching of 10,000 black women, men, and children as self-protection on the part of the white race. By rendering violence black, an anti-black social order disguises the brutalities entailed in its own reproduction. 
and prevents them from being recognized as violence in the first place. So the Harambe story, a story of human domination and the violence of capitalism, is repackaged and presented to us as another instance of black lawlessness. Thus the Change.org petition, which might have been penned by the zoo's legal counsel because it's so careful to valorize the zoo and absolve it of any legal responsibility, denies the personal logics of the zoo and the broader society while doubling down on the criminalization of black men and women. The boys' parents are accused of harming everyone, the zoo, Harambe, their son, even their other children. Were these white parents who would likely find the insinuation of a risk of quote unquote serious bodily harm or even death to their children hysterical and the call for state intervention fascistic. But the black is, as Fanon clarifies, phobogenic. Black criminality, moreover, is a family affair, due not only to genetic inheritance, but also to aberrant family structure and deviant parental behavior. <coughs> to riff off of Toni Morrison's question, in what public discourse on black people does the reference to lawless violence, father absence, and maternal unfitness not exist? A good deal of social media vitriol was directed at the boy's mother, who was on the scene with her child that day at the zoo. Facebook posts called for her to be sterilized. One meme, a picture of Rame with the text written, not sure why they killed me, I was doing a better job of watching that lady's kid than she was, denigrates her twice over as a bad parent and as less capable than a gorilla. We are back in the 1830s when Harriet Washington in her book Medical Apartheid tells us local physicians forced slave women to submit to gynecological experiments against their will. And slaveholders suggested slave women did not suffer when their children were sold away from them because they had no maternal feelings to speak of. Or we're in the 1850s, 1950s when white physicians sterilized black women in southern hospitals in the U.S. without their consent or knowledge. Or back in 1965 when the Moynihan Report blamed female, black female-headed families for creating a tangle of pathology quote unquote, that led to deviancy and crime. Or back in the 1980s, when President Ronald Reagan complained about welfare queens, quote unquote, cashing their welfare checks to buy Cadillacs and drugs instead of food for their children. So many social ills, we are told, can be laid at the feet of black women. Hortense Spiller writes, quote, my country needs me, and if I were not here, I would have to be invented, unquote. The black presence in the Euro-American Western guerrilla story goes back a long way, and one way or another, the black presence has been a repressed part of every encounter between the black man woman, the white man woman, and the, and the gorilla. African people played an essential role in the exploits of great white hunters, zoologists, and taxidermists, as suggested in the earlier image from Dushaya's book, and in this one as well. But they were seen more as part of the fauna than as fellow human members of the expedition party. Carl Akeley, too, viewed Africans as part of the fauna, but a type that held no interest for him. Like Dushayu, he seldom comments on the natives whom he hires as cooks, porters, gun boys, and guides, those whose indispensable labor subtends his expeditions. In this picture, we see members of Akeley's hunting party with the corpse of the giant of Karasimbi. The caption identifies Mr. Bradley, here, and Mrs. Bradley next to him. Um, and the African people in the background are not mentioned or named. When Ainkley does acknowledge African people, it is with the detachment and contempt of a slave holder. Hospitalized with fever, Ainkley describes his guide, Bill, as stricken with worry, quote, waiting like a faithful dog with tears in his eyes staring at his master. Diane Fossey, an avid student of guerrilla language, never mastered Kinyarwanda, the national language of Rwanda. Here she describes in her book how she is struck with terror when her white guide just departs down the mountain, leaving her alone, quote unquote, in camp for the first time with only African companion. I felt a sense of comfort while watching Alan fade into the foliage with my last month of civilization, as I had always known, and the only other English speaking person on the mountain. I clung to my tent pole simply to avoid running out. A few moments after Alan's departure, one of the two Africans in camp trying to be helpful at in Nintendo Majimoto. Forgetting every word of Swahili memorized over the past year, I burst into tears and sick myself into the tent to escape imagined threats. About an hour later, feeling the pool, I asked the Congolese to repeat his statement slowly. Did I want hot water? Whether for tea or bag, he didn't specify. Fossey 
recounts what transpired with chagrin, laughing at her youthful fearfulness, but the incident is more revealing than she realizes, adumbrating the impact that anti-black affect would have on her work for the next 18 years. After an early encounter with Congolese soldiers over the expired registration on her land rover, she falsely reported to her lover, phot photographer Bob Campbell, that they had raped her, a charge he repeated in an interview many years later as justification for her animosity toward the local people. The primal scene of human and animal, it turns out, has had a third figure in it all along. Which is to say, Agamben's anthropological machine of humanism is not the only machine involved in the manufacture of the human. There is also racial slavery, which Frank Wilderson writes, brought an ontological rupture between the human and the black, the slave, rendering the black the very antithesis of a human subject, the counterpoint against which the human could gain coherence and knowledge of self. We can extend this argument then and say the human is paradigmatically both not animal and not black. <coughs> Consider figures 339 to 344 in Josiah Knott and George Clinton's Types of Mankind or Ethnological Researches from 1854. This well-known image from the polygenists of the American School of Anthropology gives visual form to the great chain of being. Here, Knott and Glidden present the core segment of the chain of being to focus our attention on three principal characters, Apollo Belvedere, representing the ideal European man, the Negro, so-called, and the uh, chimpanzee. As a formal matter, the logic of the chain is one of continuous graduated difference, which means the Negro is formally equidistant in this sketch from Apollo above and the chimpanzee below. But the figures are drawn, you will note, in such a way that the Negro looks uncannily like the chimpanzee, and both of these look remarkably different from the figure on top. The chasm made more pronounced by the fact that the figure on top is not a representation of a generic European man, like the generic Negro, generic chimpanzee, but a representation of a celebrated classical marble sculpture of Apollo, the god of music, reason, and the sun. So I'm guessing many of you have seen this image or how many of you have seen this image? Okay. It has been widely circulated and dismissed. But this image has not received the same amount of attention. This is the image that's on the opposite page and not with book to the first image. If you open the book at that page there, you see one image on the left, one image on the right. This is the companion image to the first image. And I want to suggest that it subtends the first and contains crucial information that is not conveyed in the first. This second image depicts different ape species and black peoples from various places and epochs. There is no European man or divine stand in this sight. What is of interest in this page, on this page, without pretense, is Negro ape nearness. Yes, the Negro is intermediate between the white man and the animal, the human and the animal, in a formal sense, in the left hand image, but in the right hand image we see the Negro is also quite a bit closer to the animal than to the human, unspeakably close. Blackness and animalness then form holes in a closed loop of meaning. Blackness is a species construct, meaning in proximity to the animal. And animalness is a racial construct, meaning in proximity to the black. <clears throat> and the two are dynamically interconstituted all the way down. In this sense, the anti-black social order that props up the human is also a zoological order, or what we might call a zoological racial order. Slavery therefore produces and bequeaths to us an entire zoological racial order whose foundation is the killing of beasts and many black men. It is an order in which everything human depends upon keeping the relation between the black and the animal unspeakably close. This is why killing Harambe was a collective trauma for some, because it forced the giving of a response to a question, is the black animal, that did not seek an answer. It insisted on resuturing the boy, the black boy, back into the human. It momentarily clarified what we have always left unclear, that is, a line between the black and the animal, that line whose indiscernibility the modern world depends upon. So this is why um, in the aftermath of Harambe's death, Harambe memes replicated so furiously. 
in order to restitch the negrophobic social fabric by reopening the question of black animal nearness. I'm not going to show you the memes, but I will describe a few of them. Many of them linked um, Harambe to Trayvon Martin and to Black Lives Matter, including one where President Obama is depicted saying, if I had had a son, he would have looked like Harambe. Some memes compared with Harambe to Michelle Obama, including one that placed their faces side by side and said they shot the wrong gorilla. Another featured black actress, Gabori Sidebe, saying they shot my husband. And another, a black child, referring to Harambe as daddy. And then there were the memes that sexualized Harambe and black men. Those went viral. Through these memes, Harambe, rendered black, is elevated and debased at once, vaulted into and out of human status in the same gesture. And in this way, if the interconstituted race and species meanings get repaired fragment by fragment, until once again we cannot tell where blackness ends and apeness begins. So in closing, let me circle back to the beginning. In 1999, a gorilla was born in the Gladys Porter Zoo in Texas, and the zoo held a contest to select the name for him. The winner was a white man who happened to have been working out at the gym when he heard Rita Marley's reggae song, Harambe. Harambe means all pulled together in Swahili and relates to traditional notions of community self-help. In this post-colonial age, the, world, the word has taken on multiple contradictory meanings. The zoo undoubtedly chose the name Harambe as a cognate of the more familiar and reassuring Kumbaya, but the word remains open to interpretation. What if we, following Rita Marley's musical inspiration, hear Harambe as the battle hymn of the ongoing struggle against oppression, murder, and incarceration? What if we hear Harambe as the anticipatory death knell of the Zulu logo racial order? What if we hear Harambe as a funeral dirge for the human, and at the same time as a lullaby for the birthing of a new world? Let me end with the words of black vegan activist and author Af Ko, who has a new book out with her sister Silco called Afroism, Essays on Pop culture, feminism, and black veganism from two sisters. Black veganism is an Afro-futuristic praxis. People who have been oppressed and minoritized are actually challenging white supremacy by re-articulating their relationship to literal non-human animals. We are also developing a new relationship to animal as a social category that we have been placed in by white supremacy. We have to climb out of our trenches and start building the world that we have always made. We need to start working today on conceptual blueprints for that world. My goal isn't to be an activist my whole life. I'm merely trying to find new conceptual territory to build a new world where I can breathe and relax. At the end of the day, having the ability to exist, to breathe, to create, to relax, and to love is something we should all be able to do better. As long as that's not a reality for certain living beings,